Monday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today is a special day for me. Today is a day that I did not think was coming after two and a half seasons. We are on our 299th episode, 299 interviews, 299 guests, 299 uh, shows that you have tuned in and listened to. I feel like I'm driving on the Transcanda heading out of Calgary towards a uh, 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 Saskatchewan, watching my speedometer roll over from 299,999 to 300,000. And I'm so happy to be with me on this journey to the 300th episode. The Honorable Member for Chestermere Strathmore, Miss Leela Ahir. Leela, thank you so much for doing this. Chris, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to speak with you and actually be able to be in this format. Um, it's very, very nice to hear your voice. Um, Leela, if you've listened to the show before, but my listeners will know what the first question is going to be out of my mouth. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, well, I've actually, I've been a volunteer in my community for forever. So I think, and even my children, my, my oldest son was the recent president of the Rotary Club. Um, all of them have volunteered. My, my husband, we've all been on, you know, food bank boards and, and various boards throughout. So I think the the desire to serve has been longstanding in my family. So I don't think that that was ever a question for me. This particular type of duty to serve, um, believe it or not, I've been in the background for such a long time. It never actually occurred to me to be sitting. I never thought I'd be sitting having a discussion with you as a, an elected official, that's for sure. Um, but, um, you know, seven years ago, um, when the floor crossings had happened, and I had been very, very involved on the wild rose side of things, and um, I ended up with seven gentlemen in my kitchen one night. Um, I, I'm a choir teacher and a musician, a professional. So I just finished my choir, um, which that left at about 9.45 at night because you always do that. And it came down to the kitchen full of lovely men sitting around talking to me about the floor crossing and who our next candidate was going to be. And I'm like, great, who am I door knocking for? Out with, like, where do we need to go? And they're like, it's you. <laughs> Literally almost. I mean, I've always, you know, the, the duty to serve comes from lots of different places. It's not just the face for it stuff. As you know, having been married to a former minister, you know, the, the, the duty to serve is, is something that I think comes from your heart and, and where, where it is that you're at. But you have to have people have faith in you. And when that happened that day, I was literally shocked. And they had to chase me down for about two months before I finally said yes to that because um, you question your capacity and your ability and all of those things that um, come into play but I think once I figured it out and once I got into this place I am so blessed and so honored to be serving in some capacity so so before we talk about that 2015 election let's jump back to Missa here as a child Leela as a child um were you politically active as a child? Was your family politically active? And just talk me through about those dinner table conversations between your mom, your dad, and you. Was it politically motivated or was it uh, the traditional family like mine where they talked about it, but it was more of a, only if the larger family got, it, right, got it into the, involved in politics? So um, it's interesting because we've always had um, very, very large discussions about many issues. Table. So I don't know if you know this about my, my dad is from Southeast Asia. So he's black and my mom is Caucasian. She's Irish, English, Scottish, and Scandinavian. So yeah, it's a big, I always call myself brown. It's a very interesting combination. And so you can imagine there was a lot of fiery discussions um, when you have that kind of power packed into your, your family. And then my larger family, my dad comes from a family of 11 and my mom is an only child. So when we would always visit in India, the conversations, oh my goodness, around politics and family, and it would, they were huge. And I learned so much. My um, one of my uncles, my dad's older brother, was a cert, was a judge in uh, South Southern uh, India, and his my dad's father was also a circuit judge in that area. So we always heard stories about how, in order to remain impartial, he had to travel. So they had their babies all throughout Southern India, and. So he was never in one area for too long in order to create, make sure impartiality was there when he was doing his judgments. So I come from a long line of um, passionate advocates. Um, you know, we have family members that were alive during the partition, and well, not anymore, but were alive during the partition in India when uh, India and Pakistan gained independence. So we understand colonialism 
um, it's a huge part and factor in my family. My husband's family, um, who are from Punjab, were immensely impacted by partition. In fact, um, so many of the things and um, that they have gone through in their lifetimes, which is we can talk about later about my husband and his background, um, have been attributed to a lot of the trauma that goes around with moving an entire country, right? You can't even imagine it. It's, and so when you talk historically to families on both sides, and my mom and dad-in-law on my husband's side do not read or write in any language and manage to get over to Canada, raise this beautiful family of people who are huge contributors to the economy and to Canada and to the fabric here. So you can imagine from that perspective, hearing from them what it's like to be Canadian and that grounding in that and what it meant for them to come to a country like this and to have these freedoms and to be able to raise a family here. And still to this day, do not really formally read or write in any language and yet have managed to carve out amazing lives for themselves. So I've had a tremendous amount of impact politically. And as a young person, I was invited, I was involved heavily in um, the United Nations youth groups and organizations. I was also um, very, very involved in, and believe it or not, in anti-racism. Of course, it was called a lot of different things back then. But um, in 1980, oh, goodness, I always try to remember, I think it's 1985. Um, I, being the very, very vocal girl that I've always been, do you remember, I don't know if you remember when Sunridge Mall and all of those were being built at that time and like- I've been I, here I, for three years. I've only yeah. lived in Calgary for three years, so no. It was like the big mall for us, out as country people, right, out in Chestermere. Anyways, there was a rally that was going on there and I went over to see like what was going on because it was a rally. And it was a bunch of people that were promoting white supremacy. And they had asked me just generally like my background. I'm like, oh, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, oh, well, you're an abomination. And I'm like, pardon me. I'm like, can you, I was like, I was 15 and very, very offended, obviously. And gave out my, my mailing address and I'm like, prove it, right? And so then suddenly I found myself under the very, very, in the very interesting situation whereby I was receiving hate mail from the Aryan nations just outside of Caroline, Alberta. So I was shocked and I remember saying to my dad, I'm like, what are they talking about? Because somehow I had like infiltrated the, you know, the white Christian line. I, I, the whole thing was just mind boggling to me because I had been raised in such diversity, like from the get go, like we had friends and family from every faith, every background, every sexuality, like it was just open book. I, we come from family. My, my dad is a, an engineer. My mom is a musician and an artist. So we were just exposed to absolutely everything. So you can imagine the conversations around our table. So this really took a life of its own. And my principal at the time, Mr. Thomas at the Chestermere High School, I, I took it to him and we did a small, um, I guess it would have been like a, like a presentation to the grade 10s and 11s about racism at that time. And it was interesting. People were like, well, what's that? Like they talked, they were like asking about like car racing. You know, and and it was it was genuinely interesting for me that um, I, I sort of fell into that Mediterranean sort of look. So I was surrounded by Italians, so I was surrounded by Italian too, and I was you know, so it, for me, you know, the integration of being one of the only people of color in my area at that time, it was it was pretty seamless. You know, there was there was little things I had never experienced racism like that before, and then and then bringing it forward to my principal, who's still my friend to this day, I might add, um, and, and being able to have this conversation around the table, it became very apparent to me at that time um, that I was supposed to be talking about this and oddly enough come full circle to be in a ministry that had the anti-racism council and working at such a high, you know, really, really deep and weedy levels at this, it, I am, um, I don't know, sometimes there's a pathway that's there for you that you can't explain and, and you end up being in these beautiful situations. <music> Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell 
people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. Before we get back onto the topic of uh, your family, I want, I want to dig a little bit deeper into that uh, racism that you just talked about there. I, 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 hope I, I hope you answer this question the way that I want you to answer it, but I, I feel like it's not going to be answered that way. While those protesters were white supremacists at Sunridge Mall when you were 15 in 1985, um, I, I don't see those type of protesters much anymore. They have moved to the online format of protesting, the, the, the racism on, uh, on, online. How do we combat that in today's society where social media seems to be a breeding ground for hate, vile, and racist rhetoric? And, and I'm not just saying from the right, I'm not saying it's all from the white nationalists, but there are some people on the left that I have to look at and I go, shake your head, because if this is what you think you can talk to your children like, then I want to talk to your children and set them straight. How do we fight racism online these days? This way, we, we hold them but we actually, I had, um, I'll send this to you. Um, I had to take a picture of it. Um, I was promoting, there's a piece of policy coming out from the government now, right now from labor and immigration regarding um, making sure that we recognize professional designations for new Canadians and others, because we're really wanting obviously to attract people to the province for jobs and, and making sure that there's a safe and, and organized way for them to, so they're not just in survivor jobs, right? So they're actually able to uh, go about their professional designations and this is actually a piece of um, information that came from the anti-racism council through racism community like a lot of the work that came I, I we honestly um no government can take credit for it it comes from a lot of different places it's been worked on since before certainly i was in government through um through the previous government and even into the pc so this has been a long-standing uh, piece of work though so i had posted about it how great it is because we have labor shortage here in alberta how is it that we attract well, I had this one person and I'll share it with you. I'll send you a text of it because I did take a picture because they took it down. And they said something about, I'm trying to find the picture, but um, sort of loosely that, um, that, uh, that this was absolutely ridiculous and something about how um, Southeast Asians were taking all of the jobs. And then I fought back like great right on social media. I'm sorry, I'm quoting because I can't see it in front of me. But I went right back and I said, so you're telling me my dad who came in 1963 with five dollars in his pocket who is a engineer who has helped to change the way that particulates are looked at in the air as a sour gas well guy his who actively participated in the country my my and i went out and my father and mother-in-law who came with absolutely nothing no education have contributed meaningfully you're telling me that my family and who i am are not worthy of having jobs and being here i just went straight on and i was very thought I was kind, I wasn't mean or anything, but it was obviously a very um, strong statement. And all of a sudden, all of these other people chimed in, Chris, in the best way possible, because I did not let it sit, right? And whenever I hear that stuff, or if I post about, you know, National Transgender Day, or if I post about, you know, anything that has to do with a community that may be deemed as marginalized, or looking at, like, for example, like, I will post just something as simple as Indigenous Veterans Day, because we have this week leading up to um, to our Remembrance Day, where we acknowledge veterans, we are of Indigenous descent, we had, I acknowledge first responders and frontline workers, we acknowledge women in the in the uh, Air Force. You know, like all of these things. It's a wonderful way to really educate about our contributions to war efforts, or however it is that you want to to state that. And even doing that, oh, well, you're, you know, this is, um, you're, you're being, um, you're segregating, you are, why would we talk about Indigenous people and veterans, we should only be celebrating on November 11th, like any excuse, and these people are, they, they may find their voice on social media, but Chris, you and I, media and others will hold them accountable. The only way to change it is to shine bright lights on it. I refuse, I refuse to use partisanship 
or being an elected official or the thought of that I might lose my job because I have a voice as any excuse to stand down on any of these issues. I refuse to do it. I love people too much and I, I, I'm a firm believer in um, that when you stand up for one person's right, you stand up for all of our rights. And if you cannot do that and you're not willing to do that and you're willing to segregate based on politics, partisanship or anything like that, you're actually putting you're, you're putting a pin in where your stand is that deems that one person is better than another. And it's never okay and it's never worthwhile. And there's, there's education and accountability and awareness that as people who care about others, we have such a platform to be able to, in the most loving way, fight back. And the, the more that we give premise to those ideas and the ability for that to grow and circulate, we're part of the problem. Then we become, you know, bystanders, inactive bystanders. So I'm not going to be an inactive bystander. I will call that out whenever I can. Well, I, I love these type of conversations because they, I start one way and then it goes completely a different way. And I love it. The, the devil's advocate me says this to you, though. Why give someone a platform by responding to the, the hate? Wouldn't you just be then fueling them to say, look, she responded to me, so I must be getting under her skin or his skin. At what point in time, because there must be a point in time when you have to say enough's enough and you just have to hit that block button or just say, screw it, I'm ignoring you because I just, my, my time and my effort is much more important to me than trying to sit here and battle some anonymous troll on social media for the next four hours. Yeah. Is sort of saying that sometimes, but the truth is, Chris, is you're worth it to me. The people are worth it to me. The statements that we're making are true and beautiful and magnificent and change the culture. If that means one statement at a time, I used to say one hug at a time, right? One hug at a time, you change the culture of people around you. You, you, you change the way that people look at politicians, what the expectation is of us as human beings, because at the end of the day, no matter who we are, we're humans and we're going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. And sometimes people are making mistakes. Maybe it's a preconceived notion that they have from their past or whatever. You always have to assume that people are coming from a bad place. But if I don't take the opportunity to educate and to change, I'm actually part of the problem. So if that means that I spend a few hours of my day putting out what I think is elevating and working with the resilience of the populations I work with. I mean, Alberta is this gorgeous tapestry, right? You think about the first mosque that was built in Alberta. It was built by Ukrainians, Christians, and Muslims, Lebanese in Edmonton. Right, that is that is historically incredible. Amber Valley, these incredible people who were going to were threatened with slavery in Alabama and Oklahoma that came to the north, northern Alberta to break through frozen earth and had baseball games with the indigenous and other folks around there to build and elevate you know, the incredible um, resilience of the people of Alberta. You think about the First Nations at Treaty 7 territory and Blackfoot territory that met people coming over the mountains and were their very first people that they met. And they had powwows and church ceremonies together there for years and years and years building community. Those are the things that are the drivers behind my desire to respond back. It has nothing to do with being angry or being aggressive or, or being frustrated with people. I find that if I have a platform, I have a responsibility as an ethnic female, which I actually didn't know I was until I was elected. I know that sounds goofy, but I was I was a typical, you know, Albertan girl, you know, grew up in, in, in rural Alberta, but I didn't realize the power in that statement and what the responsibility was for me as a person sitting in a position of power and what that means in order to educate, because they might not get to that person, but there might be another hundred people who are reading that that text or tweet or chat line where you take something divisive, you turn it around, you de-escalate de the situation and you come in with a thoughtful process. It's not about being angry. Anybody can be angry. And there's rightful, there's sometimes that, you know, righteous indignation, indignation is, is, uh, is meaningful, but quite frankly, um, you get a lot more from honey than you do vinegar. And so if I'm able to have a discussion and thank people for chiming in. And the truth is, Chris, is if we don't allow people to authentically speak their truth, whether we disagree with it or, or agree with it, we're not going to know where they stand. And we don't have any opportunity to fix or change or alter that what they believe their definitions are the unconscious bias to be. So if I've even altered even a teeny tiny bit, or if they've changed my opinion on something in a good way or given me a perspective, then I think I come out a better person and a better legislator. I, 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 we could talk about this for like another three hours, but I want to get back to politics because that's what uh, I, I love chatting politics. But let's go back to that 2015 election. 
the incumbent uh, M MLA for, I want to get this right here because the, the name you're writing did change in 2019, Chestermere Rocky View, uh, did floor across to the Progressive Conservatives, and then you were sort of appointed to be the Wild Rose candidate in that election. Um, as someone who had never put their name on the ballot beforehand, how exciting was it to A, see your name on the ballot, but how frightening was it to go up to doors and say, can you vote for me? <laughs> Backwards. I remember thinking, oh, I wish I could take a picture of my name on the ballot, because at that point in time, I had no idea if I was going to win or not. We had door knock our faces off. And believe me, Chris, the only reason I've ever won an election is because I work hard. I have nothing special to offer in the world other than I'm just a really hard worker that's it there's nothing special about me I just really really work my tissue off and I love I love people so that is it makes that part of my job very very fulfilling um so working backwards from there I remember seeing my name on the ballot and I remember a tear coming down my face thinking to myself that holy moly we actually made it this far if nothing else happened at that point in time it makes me emotional talking about it right now I thought for my children my grandchildren any other little East Indian girl you know, that may want to put her name on the ballot one day, I can say to them, I did that. And it was it, it at that point in time had no clue. And I only won by 260 votes, just to give you an idea. That's how close it was. So I had no idea. And then walking backwards from there, um, what I found at the doors was really, really interesting. And it is, I want to tell you too, how markedly this has changed from 2015 to even 2019. When I was door knocking, there were so many questions of like, well, you know, what are you going to do, you know, with your children? Like, how are you going to do this? And, you know, um, maybe, you know, are women even supposed to be running? And, you know, are you Christian? Are you this? Are you that? I remember it's really interesting because um, I was in, uh, in, in one area. And just to give you some idea, I'm a little bit of country, a little bit of rock and roll when it comes to faith because my mom is Anglican and my dad is Hindu. And we've had every faith in our household. And I'm a huge lover of faith. So I've been to mosque and Kane and to temple and to Gurdwara and to everything and all over the world, right? You know, when you travel, you go into all these places of worship to learn about culture and backgrounds. So I've always been completely interested in people's spaces of faith. So I, I felt very well-rounded that way. And I remember <laughs> going up to this one door and uh, there had been some nonsense going on from other uh, powers that be trying to suggest that somehow if I was um, of a different culture, a different faith, that I had no right to be running in the area. So I'll give you an exact context. So I would walk up to a door and there'd been information out there that I was Muslim. And okay, so it, it never occurred to me that that would be an issue. First of all, that's how naive I was because I'm like, cool, like whatever. So I walked up to the door and this person asked me straight. And I said, well, if I was, I would have be on the back of my car, you know, like this is who I am and this is my faith. And I said, why is, why does that matter to you? <laughs> very naively, very, you have to understand that was a very naive question. And she goes, well, you believe in Sharia law and, and stoning women in the street. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself Jesus. going, <laughs> So I was door knocking with who is a white male, older white male. And I looked at him, I'm like, do you know what Sharia law is? Like I, and I looked at her and I'm like, well, first of all, as a woman being stoned in the street, I don't think that sounds appealing to me at all. So I really don't believe that that is something that I would go for. If I was Muslim, I'd be wearing that flag. Let me tell you proud. And I said, I really, really have, let me tell you something about Canada. And what I believe in is that my entire life, has been Im impacted and influenced by people from all different faiths and backgrounds, religions and sexualities and people that they love and everything from one end of the spectrum to the other. And I said, I think I'm actually a really good person as a result of that. And he said, hopefully one day we'll be have that conversation. And I can find out from you why you're concerned about this and why you would have concerns because it actually really, it, I said to her straight out, I said, it goes against what I've always understood Canadians and Albertans to be. I said, I've had a few experiences, but I said, I'm really glad you asked me this question because now I can be educated a little bit more about what you're concerned about. And I'm going to call you back and I'm going to give you a little bit more information. I'm going to have a couple of my Muslim friends, my girlfriends call you back and tell you about their culture and who they are and how privileged we all feel to actually be working within this space together. So it was a great, it started off as a weird conversation, but it became really, really powerful and actually became friends with her. Um. I, I, I just got noticed that uh, you have another meeting coming up here, so I need to wrap this up. And we, I feel like we haven't even touched anything yet, so we might have to do part two here later on. So. Uh, Chris, 
anytime I would be honored. I think these are really worthwhile discussions. I feel honored that you would have me on, honestly. Yeah, um, so we will leave it there because uh, you do have other things that you need to do, but part two will be in 2022. I'm going to hold her to a cat right here uh, to follow up on what has happened and uh, where, where, where life went from being elected in May of 2015. Um, Leela, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And like I said, I look forward to part two in 2022. I'm looking forward to Chris. Love you so much. And please give your family big hugs and kisses from me and stay healthy, okay? <laughs>